Hello everybody, welcome to our webinar. My name's Jack and I'm going to be hosting this session. On with me I've got Ben Coleman who works alongside me with the uh, with Vista development of, of Vista Free. So we'll just wait a few more moments for more people to uh, join the meeting and then we'll get going. So this session is an introduction to Vista Free. I'm going to take you through some of the basic features of the software from patching, creating some layouts and then creating some stage looks and storing and editing them. We did do a similar webinar last week so we're actually repeating some content but we wanted to give other people more chance to join live. Um, so Ben's going to be monitoring the chat throughout this webinar. If you do have any questions um, about the topics that we're discussing and loosely around them please feel free to pop them in the chat and Ben will either answer in the chat or chime in and get me to demonstrate a couple more things in there so we do encourage questions uh, we like the interactivity um, yeah we'll just see uh, see what we can do um, this video will be uploaded to our YouTube channel Vista by Chromacq um, either today or tomorrow along with all future webinars as well so with that let's get going um, if some of you are new and didn't join us last week um, I'm actually previewing release free which is an upcoming software release so you might see a few things that look a little bit different and explain them as we go um, so I've got a new show started here um, you can create a new show file by pressing file and new show and you'll be asked to give it a name and then you're immediately placed in the patch screen and the patch screen is the first window that we see up here towards the top left of the screen there are six navigational windows in Vista and they're always uh, at the top left by default. I'll just quickly introduce them. So the first is the patch screen. The second is the virtual console view. The third one is what we call the fixture chooser. This is where we do most of our programming. We'll be looking at this shortly. The fourth is the timeline. The fifth is the playback view where we can see the queue list we've already created and the queues that are playing back. And the sixth window is a new customizable window which I might demonstrate further at the end of this uh, webinar. So the first screen is the patch screen and the default view is something that we call the table view which basically is a visual representation of the 512 channels available in each DMX universe. And the Vista Universe tabs go horizontally across the top, and these go all the way up to uh, 256. So to work in a universe, we can just click it. Over on the right-hand side, this is where we find our factory library, and we can expand it by left-clicking on this drop-down just here. So here are all of the manufacturers that we uh, have in our library, for example, ChromaQ, we can scroll down and see all of the Chrome Q lighting fixtures in here and we will just select something uh, to work with it. A much better way of working with the, uh, the patch is actually to search for the fixture that you'd like. So you can just start typing characters. For example, I can search for Robin 1200 LED wash and it just filters down to any of these characters. So there's a few modes of each fixture. Typically, we keep the name of the documentation the manufacturer sets. Robe call them mode one through six. So if I want to work with mode one, I just need to single click and it will be highlighted when doing so. Towards the bottom of this screen, we've got our patch tab, whereas we define some settings that we want. So the quantity is how many of these fixtures do we want to patch in a single instance. Let's go for 10. So I can type the number 10 numerically on my keyboard, or I can click the up and down arrows to the right of this entry box just here. The label is the fixture name. And this is the name that's going to be shown to you underneath the fixture icon within the fixture chooser and also any other place you might reference it. For example, the timeline or the output view. So I'll just call this LED wash just because it's for my reference. The fixture number, this is quite important. Every fixture number in our show file will have a unique number and that unique number is this fixture number. It auto increments by one every time we patch a fixture. 
If you also want to use Vista's command line to select fixtures and type syntax such as 1 through 5 at 100%, we're selecting fixture number 1 through 5. So that's just something to bear in mind if you do want to work like that. The multi patch, I'll come back and explain shortly. But let's move on to the other settings underneath. So the DMX universe is which universe tab we'd like to patch into. And the DMX address is, of course, the starting address within that universe. The absolute address, the easiest way to explain this is absolute address 513 is DMX universe 2 address 1. So you can think of this as not being a limit of 512 channels per DMX universe. Some theatres like to use that, for example. Let's put that back to one. The spacing, by default, this actually tells you how many DMX channels this Robin 1200 wash takes up. So this takes up 45 channels, which means in the next available space, the next fixture is going to be patched. How many channels the fixture takes up is also noted in brackets at the side of each fixture up here, so 45 channels. Once we're happy, we can hit patch. So if I hit patch, we'll see 10 Robin 1200s patched one after another in universe 1. We can see the next fixtures starting here. So we see the ID number auto increasing and we also see the uh, name there as well. Let's patch some more fixtures. To do that, we'll just click into universe 2 and I'll search for some more. For example, the Mac Vipers. I can click the mode that I'd like to patch to find the quantity and give them a name. You can see here the fixture number auto increments by what? Uh, for me, so it's already starting at 11, which is the next available spot. Now you don't necessarily have to fill in this bottom information uh, down here. The reason for that um, is that you can actually just drag and drop uh, from here and drag it in. So now you can see I can just drag and drop and let go where I want to, to patch. So 150 or wherever you want. So I can just drag this back to one. So that's a method that a lot of people use just to drag into their DMX address. And before I continue, I need to find out how to uh, remove the annotations from <laughs> where I've just drawn that thing. Let's see. There we go. So this method um, of dragging and dropping is also how we can easily repatch fixtures. If you want to select fixtures in the patch, you can just single click them and the selection will add. But another tip is actually just to left click and hold in an empty space and then drag over the fixtures. So you can see I can select multiple. And then to repatch them, all I need to do is click and hold again and repatch them to a different DMX address within this universe, or it could even be a completely different universe, such as universe three. When we repatch something, we don't need to worry about previous programming or anything like that. It's automatically followed uh, with the fixture. Another feature that we have in the patch is something called the fixture pool, which is this space underneath this horizontal line just here. This is where we can temporarily unpatch fixtures uh, without, without actually deleting them from the show file. So we can still program these um, and then later on when we know the patch, we can just drag them and repatch them where we need them to be. So this process of finding the fixtures that you'd like to patch, selecting the model and setting a quantity and dragging and dropping is what we can do for all fixtures in our show file. Underneath the factory library, if I just collapse this, is where we can find a generics library. Within the generics library, uh, we can find lots of single channel dimmer fixtures, but it's also where we can find common LED formats, um, perhaps for some LED paths that aren't necessarily in the library. For example, this would be a intensity red, green, blue, white, 8-bit fixture. So I'm actually going to use one of these uh, generic dimmers to patch some parkats. So I can find the fixture that I want, click on dimmer. I'm going to patch six of these. I'm going to give it a name and pretend that these are my blue gels in here. And patch these. I'm going to repeat that process for six 
red fixtures. And finally I'll do the same thing again for six amber fixtures, just here. I did say I'd come back and explain what the multi-patch is, so I'll patch a generic RGBAW fixture for this. If I just find where that is. Let's pretend this is some stage set LEDs or something like that. So if we keep the quantity at one but change the multi-patch to four, what we see with this is that we get four individually addressable fixtures but if you take a look at the fixture number it's exactly the same so if I also show you this in the uh, fixture chooser this is um, one control it's this fixture here it's fixture number 49 so if I was to control this single fixture all of these DMX universes will be uh, working together so you can kind of think of this as a, a hard group let's just repatch those back for now like that. Uh, and finally, uh, let's patch some some seven color profiles. Sometimes you may need to move this vertical slider just to see the whole mode. Let's just go for uh, six of these in here like this. So that's my patch complete that I'm going to work with today in this uh, webinar. One of the most important windows in the patch is called the Connect Universes. This is where we route the virtual universes that we patched to physical DMX ports on our consoles or Ethernet-based lighting system. So within the Connect Universes, this would show me um, the console that I've got connected. I don't have any physically connected today, but what I have got is a virtual MV in my virtual console view. So that's showing these two ports uh, here. The critical bit is that you need to assign the Vista universes to the ports. So for example, I could just send universe one to port one and universe two to port two or universe three to port two or even one to both if you want to use it almost as a splitter uh, you can do that as well if you're working with Ethernet distribution systems um, normally uh, the ports available automatically show up underneath here um, but if they don't you can manually add a network connection down in the bottom left and you can choose to add either ArtNet Pathport or streaming ACN and you just set your appropriate settings and press add. We'll pretend we're working with some ArtNet today and just press add uh, three times. Don't forget that if you are working with ArtNet, ArtNet starts counting its settings from zero so you may need to assign them like this. The eagle eye of you uh, may have also noticed um, a new column in R3 which is called Output Enable. This is only for Ethernet uh, based protocols. It allows you to toggle that protocol on and off, um, which is useful in touring situations, for example. Two quick more things to discuss within the patch screen. Um, we've also got a list view where you can view your patch in a spreadsheet style way and you can click on the columns to sort your information in ascending or descending. But a feature that I like to use here is also the search so you can filter this. For example, I can type the word blue and this would tell me where all of my blue parkans are even though they actually a single dimmer channel for instance. The DMX view is just a dynamic DMX output view of your actual output of your console. So this can be useful for uh, troubleshooting. The last thing that I need to explain is these DMX macros here. These are the macros that are typically built into a fixture. The strike is a lamp on command if you're using discharge sources. Douse is a lamp off command and reset would uh, perform a full mechanical calibration of that fixture and to apply these all we need to do is select the fixtures and then press one of them for example strike a little macro window pops up um, if you hit ok the macro will be triggered straight away so you can just hit ok and that will happen but 
If you did need to adjust the stagger time, so the wait time in between each uh, macro, you can adjust that. So this might be useful if you're using um, generators and you don't need to blow up the whole power supply, for example. So that pretty much concludes my first little demonstration about the patch screen. So are there any questions in the uh, chat there, Ben, that I need to go over? No, we're uh, pretty good with, with what we have right now. Yep. Cool. So in which case, we can move on to talking about the third window, which is the fixture chooser. So within the fixture chooser, you can zoom in and out by using the scroll wheel on a mouse. Uh, but within the GUI itself, there are some zoom controls down towards the bottom left. So I can zoom out with the minus, zoom in with the plus, and the 100% would zoom to fit your fixtures within the current workspace. And the current workspace is how much space you've got on your screen just here. The little red icon just here is zoom to fit the selected fixtures. So if I want to quickly take a look at this one, you can press this and it would zoom in to fit that in the center of my screen. So personally, I like to toggle between these two modes. It gives me a really efficient way of uh, navigating the layout. In terms of what we're seeing in the actual fixture chooser itself, uh, it's comprised of square or rectangle icons. These are the actual fixtures themselves uh, within Vista. And the pentagon icons are groups. So Vista will automatically create groups of the same fixture type for you. So this is my Viper group, for example. This is my pointer group. So groups can offer a quick way of selecting multiple fixtures. In terms of arranging fixtures within the layout, the way that we do that is we select fixtures. So we can single click on fixtures or just like the patch, if we left click and hold in an empty space, we can drag over multiple items together. For example, all of these stimulus just here. And to move them, we just click and hold and drag around the space. So we can start to create a layout that suits our own personal preference. There's no right or wrong way of how you create your layouts, but most Vista users would typically either arrange them in a plan view that represents their real stage, or they'll kind of group them together so it's easy uh, to have access to those during programming. In this next example, I'm going to just quickly introduce the way that we can create multiple layout tabs. And the layout tabs are found here at the bottom of the fixture chooser. If we right click in an empty space, uh, we can find the contextual menu and the top option is called uh, layouts. The first one is the kind of master properties for this layout. We're not going to go through all of these settings in this webinar, but we will cover it in a future webinar in a couple of weeks time, which we'll be announcing very shortly. For the purpose of this webinar, I just want to explain that we can rename the layouts by double clicking. So I can call this moving lights. And if I want to add a new layout, I can click the plus down here. So clicking the plus, I'd get a second layout with everything in there by default. I'm going to call this uh, dimmers and LEDs. The most important thing within the layouts is called item visibility over on the right hand side. So just like the patch screen, we have these little drop downs. If I untick the groups, you can see that the groups are hidden from this particular layout. They're not deleted from the show file, they're just hidden from this exact layout. So I can do the same thing with the fixtures. If I hide my moving lights, I'd just be left with my dimmers and LEDs. So I can do the exact opposite on this screen. I don't want to see any fixtures apart from those moving lights just here. So now I have two layout tabs, one for the moving lights and one for the dimmers and LEDs over here. Just for purpose of demonstration, because we're not using a visualizer in this webinar, I'm just going to show you some other tips that we can also do with the actual icons itself. So I'm just going to separate these off into their um, different colors just by dragging and dropping. So let's go for the amber ones just here. What we can do is if we select fixtures, we can right click and within that same right click menu, we can come down to items and set an icon color. A little window will pop up and then we can pick a new color so that I've given myself a visual aid that these fixtures are my uh, red dimmers. 
when we start to work with intensity, um, the intensity is normally white. We actually call that an additional step, uh, which is gel color. So if you did want to set that gel color, um, it's right click items and gel color. So I'm quickly going to do that for the uh, other fixtures, just so we can see what's happening when we start to um, store cues in a minute. So right click, go to items, icon color, and we can repeat that step for the gel color as well. So it's looking pretty good. Let's just put these over here. And it's going to be okay for this particular layout. Before we move on to uh, actual programming, I'll just quickly introduce how you can create groups. Again, we will be doing a dedicated uh, webinar on groups and group properties and all that type of stuff. But quite simply, when you start a new show file in Vista, we have this thing at the bottom of our screen here, which is called the multi quick picker, which is basically split up into four columns, one, two, three, and four. And the stuff that we can see in each column is specified by the left hand drop down box of each column. We can see things like groups, presets, and other things. So one of them is groups. And here we can see the seven groups that Vista's made automatically for us. One of them is all of the dimmers, which would be all uh, 18 of these fixtures, which perhaps is not always too useful. So to create a new group, what we can do is select the fixtures in the group, right click in this box down here and press create new group. I can then give it a new name. So let's call this blue. We'll see a new component here, but we will also get a new Pentagon icon, which we can move around the fixture chooser as well and put where we like. So I'm going to repeat that step for the red dimmers, right click, create new group, give it a new name. And I'll do the same thing for the amber fixtures. I'll give you a top tip as well. If you want to do that a little bit quicker, you can actually hold down the yellow modifier on your console or the control or command key if you're using Windows or Mac, and then just simply left click in any empty space or the little yellow plus that appears just here. That is the same create group action, but arguably it's a little bit quicker. So we can just drag that over here like this. So I've now quickly made a couple of layouts to make my programming a little bit easier. In terms of fixture control and programming, all we need to do is select the fixtures that we'd like. So let's turn these lights or select them. And then we can work with the features over on the right hand side. The default feature view uh, is called the all features, which gives us quick access to intensity, position, color, and beam. But you can see the only thing applicable right now is intensity because that's the only thing that these fixtures can do. So that's typically how this will work. If a fixture can do something, it will be shown to you. If it can't, it will either be grayed out or not shown to you at all. Now, Jack, mm -hmm. question, question here. Uh, some of your fixtures are kind of a little wonky on their spacing. How can we line those up and create them a nice even line or things like that? That's a very good question, um, which I normally do myself. So I normally have layout OCD, but I was uh, trying to ignore it for this one. So Vista has a couple of tools to uh, be able to help you with that. Uh, the first is a line. So you can see here, if I just exaggerate this a little bit further, if we select the fixtures, right click, the first tool is called align. So we can align to the top, bottom, left or right edge. So if I just show you the left in this example, it's going to look rubbish because they've all been aligned to the left edge. But I just wanted to show you what that did. So here I might choose to align to the top edge to make sure that all of these are perfectly in a nice space. Other tools available are distribute which puts an equal space between the first and last fixture in your selection. So if I was to right click, go to distribute, you can distribute along a vertical or horizontal plane. So if I press horizontal, you've now got a nice equal space in between each one. Um, again, I'm not going to go through all of these too much, um, but you've also got some other arrangement tools like arranging in arcs, circle or grids. We will go through this in much more detail in a future layouts and sorts webinar. Does that answer the question there, Ben? Yeah. Yep, I think that takes care of it right there. Yep. Cool. Uh, I've just also turned on a uh, 
layout preference, which just shows you the intensity in the fixture as well, which will probably help us for uh, this uh, webinar. So I'm just going to jump back to my uh, moving light layout for a second, because there's a few more things to control uh, just here. I'm just going to hide these other groups as well. Just so we can see the moving lights. I'll just zoom in a touch. Okay, uh, so if I select some fixtures that do more than just change intensity, for example, you can see that more fixtures are highlighted, highlighted on this side. So here I can click and scroll to do intensity. Um, the left hand arrow is 0%. Or the right hand arrow is 100%. Uh, We've also got some 10% increment shortcuts at the top here as well. This would be position. Now we're not using a visualizer, but if you just look at the fixer chooser icons themselves, they do give you a rough indication of position. So we can use that to tilt the lights forwards, perhaps. And if you wanted to do the perhaps odds up, then you could just move them like this. We've got a color picker, so we can just visually pick the color that we want. Let's go for yellow. We've got a gobo overview, and then we find things such as zoom and focus control. So like I said earlier, this is just a quick overview of all of the features. Each feature itself has then got a dedicated feature tab at the top. So if I want to see more detail on intensity, you can click the sun icon. You've still got the same slider as before, but this is where we also find control over things like shutter and strobe rate, and they all use this graphical slider uh, interface. At the bottom of the feature browser itself, we have what we call the custom or raw DMX tabs, these square boxes, and this is just a direct channel control for these features. You can again manipulate these by clicking and holding and dragging or typing a number in there. For example, I could define 130 DMX bits and enter, and it would set the correct intensity for me. So that's just another way of, I guess, taking more really precise control. So this way of opening up the feature tabs as you need it, um, it's the same for all of the features. Position uh, has the same crosshair as before. It's actually showing me these two lines here because it's showing me the difference in pan. But if I just home this, you can see that they're moving together. So I could move tilt only from this view or pan only. Of course, continue to use the little joystick. A little tip that I could give if you're using the graphical interface alone to control um, position and you're not using physical console encoders, you might want to press this fine toggle, which just gives you a really nice uh, low amount of resolution so you can really do um, accurate positioning without the lights going crazy and following this course movement just here. The color tab, this um, looks a little bit more uh, busy because it's got more options to play with here. We have the same color picker as before, but this time we can think of color as a lighting designer in terms of hue, saturation, and value, CMY, or RGB. And that's what these sliders are underneath. They're just ways for you to think about and create color. And again, you can just move these sliders around, and this just feeds back visual information to you all of the time. So we could do a primary red, for example, even though this sport has a CMY color mixing system. We also have a leaf filter picker if you want to search by name or number, um, in addition to a color wheel. So this sport has a CMY color mixing system in addition to a fixed color wheel. So by clicking the color wheel tab, we can see not only the colors that are in the slots, but their position within the wheel itself. So we just click on the color to select it. If you want to index the wheel, you can just press index and then move this slider from the left to the right. So by indexing a color wheel, this is how you would achieve split colors on stage, for example. If you want to spin the wheel, you just click spin. Uh, when we spin something in Vista, this slider always starts from the center because if you move to the right, you would do a clockwise slow to fast. And if you move to the left, this would be an anti-clockwise slow to fast. 
this makes a little bit more sense if I demonstrate this with the gobo wheel because they behave in the same way which I'll show you in just a moment. Underneath you can see that we're still showing all of the direct channel controls for this particular fixture. Um, so we can see CMY as before, but you may also find in these uh, raw DMXs channels that are mapped to this sort of generic fixture model. And CTO, so color temperature correction, is one of those within the Viper spot. So the only way to interact with this by default is to type a numerical number or click and hold and then drag the slider up and down to change that. So let's take a look at the uh, Gobo wheel. So the gobo wheel is again represented graphically. So if you want to pick a gobo, we can just click it. If we want to index the gobo, we select gobo index mode and move this slider. We see a little representation here as well. So now I can demonstrate the spin that a little bit better. So if I move from the right, I get clockwise slow to fast. If I move to the left, I get anti-clockwise slow to fast. These two buttons here, uh, this button is reverse spin at the same speed, and this one, the little red house, will be stop spin. So these are kind of more artistic tools. Let's just spin this for now. If a gobo has multiple gobo, so if a fixture has multiple gobo wheels, or indeed color wheels, they'll be represented by uh, tabs at the top, just here. So we can see gobo wheel 2, the effect wheel 3, and we actually show prisms as gobo wheels in Vista because we can still work with that graphically. If I want to add a full face prism, you just select it and index and spin it in the exact same way as you would a gobo. So the last feature tab is called the beam feature. This has two sub tabs. One is frames. So if you're working with mechanical framing shutters, you'll be able to visually move these. The Vipers don't have those, but you can imagine what happens here. In the focus tab, we have generic control over focus, zoom, iris, and frost. The only last tab within the feature bar is called the custom. This is where we just have sub tabs of all of those raw DMX square direct channel controls. The only additional one here that you can't find anywhere else is called misc, miscellaneous. This is often where we find, oh sorry, hide uh, a lot of the control channels that you typically don't want to be accidentally programming such as resets or that type of stuff. So let's jump back to um, the all tab. We'll just change the position of these. Let's pick a color and for these ones let's make this go pink and we'll just go up like this. One of the best unique features uh, of Vista is that we can copy and paste looks between fixture types using the generic fixture model. So if I select my spots, we can do an edit copy from the menu or control C or command C depending on your operating system. Select completely different fixture types and do edit paste or control V and you can see that the system will um, copy and paste that look. So even if I paste it onto some uh, LED washers that don't have gobos, it will attempt to recreate that stage look as close as possible. So this is a really useful uh, tip. Another useful tip that I'd just like to uh, introduce for the first time is Vista's fan key. Now the fan key is the yellow key on your console modifier or the control or command key on a normal computer keyboard. Fanning works across selection order, and selection order is represented by the blue number in the top left of each icon. So if I go left to right or right to left, you can see it's representing the selection order that I made, which fanning will also work across. So if I hold my fan key and do color, for example, you can see that I can fan color from where I'm pulling from, so from orange to pink. And the fan mode is actually defined at the top right of the screen. The default is a linear fan, which will spread mathemat mathematically from the middle out, like I've just demonstrated. But we could also choose another fan shape, for example, fan from the center. When changing fan mode, you'll notice those blue icons change to represent the new. So it's now not 1 to 10, it's 1 to 5 and 5 to 1. So from here, for example, I could go from pink to blue just by selecting this. Let's move the lights around. And if I pop my 
fan mode back to linear, I should then be able to fan the lights in and out as well. So this would be a linear fan and a fan from the center on these fixtures just here. So that's a quick introduction about how we uh, control fixtures. Of course, the next step in programming is you might want to record presets or programming templates to help speed up your programming. So I'll just show you how to do that uh, very quickly with a couple of fixtures. So let's select two of these fixtures. We'll uh, turn them on, we'll move them forwards, and we'll put them in the color yellow. Presets is a component, just like groups, so it has its own place in the multi-click picker. And just like we right-clicked with groups, we can right-click here and press create new preset. The preset window pops up and we can give this a name. Let's just call this yellow at the front. Again, this is just a very quick introduction to presets. We will be doing a dedicated webinar just on presets alone and going through all of the details and other things such as home presets and highlight presets and all of that type of stuff. But this is just a quick introduction. So we can give it a name. Uh, we can also record features. We can record multiple features within a single preset within Vista. So in this case, I'm storing position and color, which is OK. I'll just do another, another example. We'll do uh, red down. Let's just do one last one as well. Let's go uh, to the left. We'll go magenta. So now because I've stored these, if I clear my programmer, which is up here at the top. So when we build stage looks, we're creating looks in Vista's programmer, which is the live tab at the fixture chooser. So if I press clear, all of this goes away and we start creating the stage look from the, from the beginning. So now if I select these same fixtures, turn them on, if I now want to put my lights back in my yellow front, red down or magenta left, I don't have to spend time programming that. I can just select the lights and click my preset template down here. And because I clicked the button called global when I created these, it means that I can actually apply this to uh, any fixtures in my show file, which can really help me as well. So that's a little topic about creating stage looks and storing presets. Any questions about that on the chat, Ben? No, there have been some other questions about uh, fixture profiles and changing Go images, which I do, we're going to go into later, um, and some other suggestions. But no, I think we're we're pretty good with what you're going through right now. Uh, I'll mention the uh, custom Gerbo images quickly because it's, it's easy. Um, so you can do that within the patch screen. Select your fixtures, and it's in the properties button. You've got customized color and Gobo wheels. Uh, the same option can actually be found uh, from within the patch drop down here as well. So if you did want to change a custom Gobo on a per show basis, so this is useful if you're doing corporate events or something, you just find the wheel slot and then you would just uh, select the image and find the image somewhere on your uh, machine and that will be popped in there. If you need to reset it back, you just hit reset to factory default. If you're working with a, a Gobo that you've kind of loaded into a fixture permanently, you may wish to edit that in the fixture profile itself as, as that becomes more permanent. You don't have to do that on a show file basis. So moving on then, let's talk about how we store cues. The first thing we need to do is create a stage look and simply in this example, I'm going to turn my uh, blue lights to 100%. And this is going to be my stage look. The first store method that I'd like to explain in Vista is called store all. It's quite a special storing operation in that it stores the stage state exactly as you're seeing it uh, on stage right now. And that's the active stage state, I should say. Uh, so you can kind of imagine this as taking a photograph. It doesn't care where the information is coming from. It, records not only what's in the programmer, uh, but also other group faders or cue lists that might be active as well. So let's take a look at that. Um, I'm just going to drag out my virtual console view, just so we can see what's going on here. So if I press my store all button, it opens up the store all window. Um, I want to create cue list number one, 
and queue number one. So these are just ID locations at the top. The queue labels, so the queue names, are actually in the bottom two boxes. So if I call this queue list store all, and we'll call the queue blue, we can change the timing, but by default it's two seconds. We'll come back to that later. If you click OK, it will be stored into the console software, but it won't be assigned to a playback. The reason it's not assigned to a playback is you have to tell it where to store to. And you do that by single clicking an empty playback on your console. So if I was to click here, when I store this, it will be stored to this location. Or you can quickly double tap as a tip just to immediately store to where you've double clicked to. This is typically a top tip that I would recommend uh, when learning the console, press store and then tap where you want it to go because then you're not going to be storing stuff to locations that you didn't expect. So you can see it's stored to this playback. We can push the fader down to release it, which is deactivate the cue list. And we can push the fader up to play it. So you can see it plays when I push the fader up. This is actually a setting that store all sets called auto play and auto release. So there it is. We've stored the look to this fader. Let's create a second queue. So if I select these fixtures, create the stage look that I want to store, I'm happy with this. Press store again. You can see the default action is to store to the last place we we're working on. So here it's Q2 of Q1. So let's call this uh, red. If you were to tap another playback, for example my empty second playback just here, the console would realize that it needs to create queue number two Q1. So that's what I meant about getting into the habit of pressing where you want it to go. You won't get caught out that way. So let's click OK. It's stored here. Um, there it is. So we can pull this down. So we now have two queues. When we push the fader up, we'd have queue number one. It would then stop and wait for me to press play on queue number two. And the play is in this button here, the middle play button. So if I press play, we transition from one to two within that queue timing, which looks good. Let's do a third queue. So we'll pull these lights down, but this time again, we'll create the ambers at full. We'll press store all. We'll give it an amber name. But this time we'll adjust the timing. So we can change the timing by typing a number in this box or by selecting a predetermined time from here. Another thing that we can do is we can adjust the up and the down time graphically by adjusting the blue and green bars here. To set a delay, we just click and drag. And to adjust the event timing itself, we would click and drag on the actual blue squares just here to lengthen or shorten this time. So in this example, uh, what would happen here is the amber lights would fade up in two seconds and then only once they've got to 100% would the red lights fade down in three. So let's take a look at that. Q number one and Q number two is as we've just seen it. But now Q number three fades up in two seconds before fading down red in three. So this is a quick, easy way to um, store split queue timings. Another way that you can create queue list is you can click the the new queue list button up here at the top, which creates a new queue list, but will immediately open this up in something that we call the live queue list editor. So we're no longer working in the live tab, but we are working in queue list two just here. So the example I'm going to do here is we'll just turn the lights on and we'll put them in the uh, yellow front preset that I stored earlier. So that's this. If you want to add a new queue in this mode, all you have to do is click the green plus up here and add a new queue. So you can see the queue square just here. And then we create the stage look. So let's go red down, we'll add a new queue, and then we'll put it magenta left. You can also name the queues by clicking in the uh, little name here. So we can call this yellow. We can do the same thing for red and magenta. You can also see that I'm clicking the, true, the Q transport controls here uh, as well. So the reason this is called the uh, live edit box is the Q or any edits that you make in this view are immediately stored into this Q. You don't have to press store or update. For example, if I want to take these fixtures here and make them go green, 
that's the only thing you do because we place this directly in this queue list. So we can just continue to play through our queues and, and make some changes. We might want to make these become less red. Maybe make these two centered ones white in this queue list. So this is simply the edit process for editing these. The only time the console will ask you to save something is um, when you click the X in the corner of this tab or close where clear normally is and it says since you made or edited this queue list you changed some stuff. What do you want to do? Do you want to save the changes and keep the queue playing? Do you want to save the changes but release, deactivate the queue list? Do you want to discard the changes and go back to whatever it was before you press new or edit or cancel and carry on working? So if I press save now, I would have saved that queue list just down here. Once you're kind of outside of a queue list edit, the way that you can uh, edit it is to press the edit button. Now in release 3 this is called edit but in release 2 uh, this is called open but it's the exact same button in the exact same space so you can press the edit and then choose a queue list that you would like to edit. So clicking OK would open up that exact same view that you've seen just there. Do you have a question there Ben or is it OK? So uh, yeah I mean when you're using store all can you show what happens when you have multiple queue lists playing and you use the store all operation or you have things from a queue list and things from live at the same time? Yeah, sure. So we can use that here. So let's just keep this yellow queue list uh, playing. Uh, what I'm going to do is just bring in those uh, dimmers into this layout just so we can see what's happening within a single layout. Um, let's just drag this queue list. So I didn't tap a playback. So I'm just going to drag this in for my second queue list just here. So let's set up this uh, stage look. Let's go to the amber queue and just bring these down a little bit. So currently, um, these two queue lists are playing. You can also choose to add some other fixtures in the programmer. So let's take these fixtures here in white. Store all captures everything. So not only what's in the programmer, which would just normally be these three fixtures, but anything else that might be playing back as well. So if I press store all, I'm just going to call uh, press a third playback over here. Just call this everything, just as an example. Here it is. Another button that I've not talked about is the uh, release button over here on F12. This deactivates any active queue list that's playing. So pressing this would turn off all active queue lists. If I now push up the third playback that I've just stored, you can see that it's captured the stage look as I had at the time. Does that answer your question there, Ben? Yeah, I think that's a good good example there. Yeah. Before I just jump back into the timeline view quickly, uh, another thing that's important to mention is that the fixture chooser tab, so this live tab here, has the highest priority in the console. So what does that mean? That means that I could select some fixtures and, and change something, and any changes that I make will be uh, immediately output to stage because this live tab has the highest priority in the console. But bearing that in mind, you could actually select all of your fixtures and turn them off or do something else in the programmer, which would mean that if you're playing back all of these previously stored queue lists, you could be thinking, well, this isn't working right. It's not stored correctly or it's not playing back correctly. It is, it's just that there's something in your programmer taking priority over that. And the easiest way to tell something is in your programmer is the clear button highlights slightly, but a better aid actually is you get this little no entry symbol in the live tab and you can click either of these actually to clear the programmer. So upon clearing the programmer, the fixtures would come back to doing the playback that they should have been doing uh, underneath. So just to go back to what I was explaining about editing queue lists, um, let's open up the um, second queue list again so I can press edit and then select the queue list that I'd like to take a look at. So here it is. Let's just get rid of this virtual view. So here's the queue. Um, let's, let's just zoom in on these guys again. So Q1 is yellow and green. Q2 is red and Q3 is uh, magenta.
one tool that I'd uh, like to just quickly introduce or one feature is something called the uh, timeline view. So in the timeline view, we can view multiple queues. You've still got the zoom in and out of controls uh, like we had before. But here we can see the individual features. So this is intensity, this is position, and this is color. So if I just zoom out a little bit, just like we did with those bars in store all, we can click and drag to adjust the uh, delay time just here. So if I just do this, and if I just jump back to the fix to choose a view just to show you the result of this now, pressing play now, what would happen is the fixtures would fade up, then they'd move forwards, and then they'd change color. So we've adjusted the delay times there. But within the timeline, you can actually click the pluses and see what each individual fixture is doing. So if you want to adjust some individual fixture timings and delays, we can still work in this graphical style. I'm just going to press uh, Control Z or Edit Undo just to reset those times just there. Because what I want to show you is a few more tricks available uh, within the timeline. If I drag over and select multiple events, you can see that you get multiple blue squares. So taking the left center or right center blue square will lengthen or shorten event time based on where you're pushing and pulling from. If you take one of the square corner points, when you move this, you will skew time based on where you're pulling from. So here you can see the 10 fixture is longer than the first. If I undo that and show you the same thing with the top and bottom sensor, this will start to skew time again where you're pulling and pushing from. But you can see the event time of each one's now the same. So this would look more linear when we play this back. So that's skewing events in the timeline. Another thing that we can do is fan events in the timeline as well. And we still use our same fan mode like I demonstrated earlier. So if I just change this to become fan from the sensor and shorten my position, we still have to hold our fan key, which is that yellow modifier or control key on the keyboard. And then we have some white lines. So if you take the left or right line and fan out, again, you can see the middle is longer than the ends. But if we take the middle white line and fan, you can see the event timing is the same. So if I just let go of this now, let's just reset the queue list. And I'll show you that in the fixer chooser view. So now with our um, custom fixture timing, the lights fade up, they then move from the ends, and then it will scroll color left to right as well. So that's a very quick uh, introduction to uh, the timeline. We will be looking at this in more detail and some other features um, as well in future webinars. Yeah, there aren't, any, no, there aren't any other questions right now. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, please bring them up in the chat. We're going to wrap this up shortly, and we're going to have some questions here. Mm -hmm. uh, demo, last... Go on. Sorry, demo patches or demo uh, fixture show files for Vista uh, with Capture. Uh, we do have a demo show file with for WYSIWYG, and WYSIWYG has a demo also that goes with that. Uh, do we have, Jack, does, does Capture have a demo show file? It doesn't, not at the moment, no. Okay. Um, which we think would be the best option that we could provide. Like I said, it, is, it does work in the free demo version. So even if you use Capture uh, for your own actual drawings and stuff, you could still download the, the WIG installation and get, and get that going. Um, if you email us at Vista support at chroma-q.com, we can send you uh, all the stuff that you need for that, which is useful. Yeah. So is that there aren't any more questions. One last thing that I quickly uh, want to uh, explain here within the QList edit is the Q view and link button. So with both of these turned off, they'll be gray when they're off. The queue that we are editing, which is this yellow box, is synchronized to the queue that's currently playing uh, on stage. So let's just pop that back to queue number one. If I click away into another queue, for example, uh, Magenta, what happens is it automatically uh, engages a view called QView. Now, you won't be able to see this too clearly in the webinar, uh, but what QView is showing me is it's showing me the visual look of Q3, but what's actually still playing to stage is yellow. So this is like a blind edit, and that's what this flashing red warning means in the yellow box around here.
it means that we're editing something visually in the fixed user which isn't currently playing to stage so we could maybe make these lights become white as well if we turn off queue view um, the queue that we are editing will be automatically synchronized to the queue that's playing on stage which is q2 because i just progressed to it so the link button this is kind of the opposite of that with link what happens is when you click a queue the stage state automatically snaps to the end look of that queue so this is useful if you're editing perhaps in a rehearsal state or you don't mind the queues changing automatically but it offers a quick workflow so for example you might want to select these lights and change them back to the yellow jump to the red jump to magenta and back to the red for example so that's just a quick introduction on, on those two features just there so time really does fly when you're talking for an hour that pretty much concludes most of the content uh, that I hope to get through in in this webinar are there any final questions in the chat no no final questions right now uh, the, the yes the the version 2 Vista 2 show files do still open in Vista 3 because uh, uh, capture does have a Vista 2 demo file I believe um, so yes you can still open that up in, in version 3 No other questions that I can see. Excellent. Well, hopefully you've uh, found today's webinar useful. We will be uploading this webinar to our YouTube channel uh, in the next day or so, in addition to a uh, kind of the repeat of this webinar that Ben will be hosting later today. We have got another webinar planned for uh, tomorrow as well, which is all about tracking and the uh, tools available to manage that. So if you haven't already registered to that one, please do, and we hope to see you there. What, one last question, uh, best practices for sa saving show files and where? Uh, when you install Vista, it creates a default Vista data directory on your computer with the shows uh, folder. Uh, we always recommend letting it do everything, store everything to its default locations, uh, and it will store all your information in there. But of course, another top tip is don't just rely on that. Um, still save shows or save copies to external uh, devices <clears throat> it's always a good programming process to have an external backup somewhere yep that appears to be it <clears throat> so yeah if, not, <clears throat> if no one else has any other questions then we'll wrap this up excellent thanks once again guys and we'll see you on the next one